Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound inner change so our natural world is valued once again. And today I'm delighted to... Uh, Welcome Gunther Hawk back. This is his second time on The Holistic Nature of Us. And today we're going to be speaking about bees and pollinators and their role in our environment. And Gunther is a retired Waldorf school teacher. He's the founder of Spikenard Farm Honeybee Sanctuary that's located in Floyd, Virginia. He is also the founder of the Pfeiffer Center in Spring Valley, New York. Both farms operate on biodynamic principles. Gunther is featured in Queen of the Sun and Vanishing of the Bees documentaries where he joins with others highlighting the issues and the grave concerns many have over honeybee population declines. Welcome Gunther and thank you for returning. It's good to be with you. All right, so let's start with your love of the honeybees and how you started Spikenard Farm, and uh, tell us about your your beginnings with the bees. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. Uh, first, I would like to say a word about the the title of your talk. Most people probably don't know that the word holistic has to do with both whole, to make things whole, and holy. And we have separated from nature on the one hand, of course, and that means we are not whole. And we have lost the holiness of our own being and also the animal world and nature in general around us. So the bees were once considered a holy animal, a sacred animal, just like the cow, a holy cow. And a scarab beetle, all these beings that care of nature and us. So the crisis of the honeybee is actually our own crisis. Mm. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. I, I I thought holistic too and holy was also connected to hummus or humus, the soil, mm. the yes. root word too. Is that correct? I'm not completely sure. I can look it up in my etymology book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do that because I, I thought I read somewhere that holistic and holy and humus were also connected. But I like what you said about we've lost this, the sacredness, the holiness of taking care of the land and what that means, what the implications are. Right, right. So I've been a beekeeper for over 40 years now and when I started uh, things were very nice, you know, we, we lost one or two hives a year and um, had good honey crops and took care of the bees in a very wonderful, natural way, not, not exploiting them, not pressuring them to give more than what they were ready to give. Mm -hmm. And um, then, of course, in 96, uh, the Varroa mite reached a point where there were no more bees in orchards and on the farms. And there was an article written in the New York Times, The Hush of the Hives. Mm. And I had just come back uh, to America, returned to America, to start what was later called the Pfeiffer Center. And I gave my first beekeeping workshop two months after after that article, so I didn't lose any time because I realized it's not only the mite that is causing the problem, but all the beekeeping methods that have been invented for the last hundred years or more. Hmm. So that's been since 1995, you started to see some problems. 
Yes. And so uh, where everybody else, including the chemical industry, focused on how can we get rid of the mites, I focused on how can we strengthen the honeybee so that she can cope with a lot of things, maybe not all things, but a lot of things that we are putting out. Mm. And uh, so my path has been from 96 on to help spread the word that it's not only them, it's not only the mites and the viruses and the bacteria and the bugs and all that that's killing the bees, but actually it's our very own beekeeping methods. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I can't, what kind of response did you get putting that kind of message out there? Well, uh, the response was silence from the professional beekeepers, of course, but more and more hobby beekeepers uh, showed that they were not willing to go on that path of uh, constant uh, treating against this and against that and the other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I found, and, and that has been going on since 96, more and more people have uh, awakened to our responsibility for the natural world and for the animals. And um, yeah, the, the, ho the hobby beekeepers are the ones that are going to be the beekeepers in the future because they are losing 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of their bees every year. It is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, about 15 percent is sustainable because bees can be replenished by making splits and, uh, you know, by natural swarming and natural reproduction, but 30, 40 percent is not sustainable. And that's what we're seeing today? We're still seeing that today, yeah. Last year we lost approximately 46 percent nationally of our bees, and that varies from region to region. Some regions are a little bit better and some are a little bit worse. And of course, there are instances where people, especially here in Virginia, lost 70, 80 percent of their bees. Oh, my goodness. That's a high, a high percentage. So, so what does that mean for future implications? I mean, how do people replace the bees and can they replace them fast enough if they're losing 70 percent? No, they can't replace them fast enough. Uh, I had a call from California a little while ago from a professional beekeeper. He has 10,000 colonies. I mean, that's the size we have, 10,000. And that's a small professional one Wow. <laughs> or a medium professional beekeeper. And he asked me what he could do. And I told him what we are doing. And he agreed with everything that I told him. And at the end, he said, I can't do it. I can't do it because my whole infrastructure is geared to trucking the bees from one place to another, from one monoculture to another. Uh, it costs him a quarter of a million dollars a year just to truck his bees around. I mean, you, you oh, look my at, goodness. Yeah. And, uh, of course, losing them uh, first from the almonds and then to the canola and then to the cranberries and then to the apples and then to the blueberries and back down to Florida and so on. You know, these bees are being trucked, uh, I would say, 20, 30,000 miles a year. And this is not what the bees likes. The bee loves to be in one place, get used to it, explore it up to the very small flowers that need to be pollinated. Some of our medicinal herbs, you know, the plantain and the golden seal. And uh, when they get trucked from one to the other, they only basically eat uh, the nectar or get the nectar and the pollen from uh, from almonds and citrus fruit and so on. That's like us eating only broccoli for three weeks 
and then uh, oats for three weeks and so on. We would not be very healthy. No, we wouldn't. And I don't think most of us realize the implications or what the costs are uh, with these large bee farms and what they subject the bees to. To me, it almost feels like the bees are enslaved in a way. You know, they're they're transported here, transported there. They're expected to work. They're expected to pollinate. And then, then they go home. And if they can recover, fine. But if they can't, well, that's the way it goes. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. So um, they are a commodity now. And the commodity is how much can I can I get out of them? It's the same, of course, with the cow and the chicken and the pig. Mm -hmm. It's not any different. So the industrial paradigm has also influenced and taken uh, beekeeping into its grasp. In other words, get as big as you can, specialize there, and and location independence. These three basic facts apply to the modern professional beekeeper. So from one location to another one, get as big as you can. So you only are um, a pollinator beekeeper who's, who gets money from pollination. Others only raise queens. Others only make packages of three pound of bees with one queen and so on and so on. So the specialization is there too, and uh, get as big as you can. The biggest beekeeper has seventy thousand colonies. Oh my goodness! Can't even picture them. And imagine if he lost forty percent, then you have, you know, you have like uh, thirty, twenty-five, thirty thousand beehives in a row. You can't even picture how many miles of beehives that would be. Right, you know? right. Doesn't that um? Isn't that also Im implications for uh, when they get back home to have that volume of bees? What do they do when they get back home? Well, they have stations, holding stations. They don't. They can't have them all in one place. Mm -hmm. They have locations mm -hmm. in Florida and California uh, where they can overwinter. Then they get fed. Uh, two, three, four gallons of corn syrup before the winter and uh, mm -hmm. that's how it goes and then a lot of them are getting sold after the pollination because the beekeepers know they won't survive. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and we have, we have imported a hundred thousands of bee packages from Australia in January, February to guarantee the pollination out west. Hmm. I, I had no idea about that either, and I think most of us don't realize that when we pick up a bottle of honey, you know, yeah. hopefully it's local, but if it's in the supermarket, um, and not even just the honey, uh, when we pick up almonds, what is that? What is the action and the choice that we make to buy almonds in, has implications for everything prior to us purchasing it. And that's a dot that we're not connecting very well. Exactly, yeah. And almonds are right behind wheat as the greatest import into other countries, mostly China, Japan, and so on. Mm. So it's a huge industry where in the Sacramento Valley we have hundreds of thousands of acres mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. in almonds. Mm -hmm. Of course, there can be no bees. There are no insects there the rest of the years. No, the rest, no insects? Well, maybe a few flies, you know, but actually those huge monocultures get sprayed so often that not much survives. Right, right. Yeah, and that makes, that's logical. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Hmm. That's the only way they can do it, yeah. Well, that's not the only way they can do it, but that's what they are geared for. That's what their irrigation, drip lines, and everything else, their spray program, all of it is geared toward that. Hmm. So mm -hmm. there is no no, uh, no idea about uh, having maybe flowers there in the summer for insects. Mm -hmm. There are a few biodynamic vineyards and organic vineyards that are doing a great job 
in having something there for the in, for the pollinating insects all year round. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. It can be done, but it's more work, and the product will have to cost a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And that's why organic is more expensive. But we are so used to having everything cheaper, 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 cheaper. That is programmed because. Let's say you have a certain amount of income and you pay a third of your income for food. You have two thirds left, left for your uh, um, for whatever else, for your car and, right. and uh, your home and so on. Mm -hmm. If you only mm -hmm. have 16 percent or 12 percent for food, then you have a lot more left to buy everything else. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the plan to keep agriculture products as cheap as possible to 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 get as much out of the economy otherwise. Mm. Yes, and I know. Course, and that's and, 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 fresh things, you know? so they have to get bigger, 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 specialize more and more. And it's it's a treadmill. Mm -hmm. It is a treadmill because that model is not sustainable. And that's right. that's the piece that you and I are trying to connect uh, through um, our outreach in, in various ways is to make the public aware of the fact that just because something is cheap doesn't mean it's cheap. There is a cost to pay, whether we pay yeah. the piper today or we pay the piper in three generations. And the question is, do we want to be sustainable for those next generations? You know, and that's yeah. what I'm all about, and that's what you're all about in terms of getting the word out. Um, tell us, tell us, since we've talked about big farming for the honeybees, tell us about Spikenard Farm and the principles that govern what you do. Yes, so uh, when I retired at the Pfeiffer Center, I had a plan already in place, and a donor bought uh, us uh, 610 acres for that plan out in, in Illinois. That didn't work because we were, uh, we, we had neighbors that got sprayed by airplane. <laughs> Sides, and I realized that's not where you can have a honeybee sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So moved to Virginia. We are now on 41 acres, and uh, there's a biodynamic farm next to us, an organic farm next to them, and just um, just orchards and, and, and pastures and woods around us. So we're in a safe place here with the sanctuary. So... If I can say the professional beekeeper asks, how much honey do I get out of my bees? And, and that is a, a right question if you have a business. You can't say, I, I keep losing, you know, you don't have a business left. So you have to make money. And that was in one advertisement a few years ago for Plastic Foundation. Uh, I can explain that later where the advertisement said, we asked some bees what would make them more profitable. You can tell your wife, uh, I love you as much as you want. If you want to, if you want to get as much as you can out of her, that's not a loving relationship. Mm -hmm. So every beekeeper loves his bees, no matter what they do to them. Mm -hmm. right? Interesting. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So our, our question to the bees is what do you need to be healthy and happy? And we only take the surplus honey. Mm -hmm. So, for example, right now, last week, we weighed the hives. We weighed all of our hives. And we know how much um, each box with bees and wax and, you know, comb, all of that weighs. And then we know how much honey they have. And if they have 150 pounds of honey, we can certainly take 50 pounds. And then we share some with the ones that have not built up enough stores. And only then take we, do we take what is a true surplus. And we always keep a good amount in winter in storage in case one hive needs or two hives needs some more food. Mm -hmm or the swarms need a little bit of encouragement if the weather isn't too good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our whole 
attitude and our focus is what do the bees need? Mm -hmm. And that goes from letting them build their natural comb. They can do it. They don't need per, they don't need to build perfectly straight comb because we extract, we extract the honey and do the work by hand. Whereas a professional harvesting maybe 500,000 individual frames of honey. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, wow. Puts these frames into a decapping machine, which takes the wax capping off. And then it gets put into huge extractors and they're bottled uh, in huge tanks. And all of that is, is industrialized. And we do that by hand. So we let them build their own honeycomb. We let them overwinter on their own honey. They don't get sugar. They don't get corn syrup. I mean, that, that's really the worst mm -hmm. to give mm -hmm. the bees who produce the honey. They don't take it from nature. They take nectar from nature. But it's a lot of work till this becomes honey. It's mm -hmm. their own enzymes and ferments and uh, other other substances that are put into it before it becomes honey. It's actually the only food in nature that never spoils. Can you imagine that? That's hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have eaten honey from the tombs, the Egyptian tombs. Of course, you need a chisel to get it out of the vessel, but it's still edible. It does not spoil. Mm -hmm. If it does not uh, get more moisture or something like that, then it would start fermenting. Mm -hmm. But it's it's really a whole food mm -hmm. and should be tre treated actually and, and sold as medicine mm -hmm. and not, you know, not cheap as, as it is now. Well, this, there's a little bit of... Um I'm going to say negative press about honey because it is a sugar. And so people are very concerned about carbohydrates and they're concerned about their blood sugar levels. Um, but I think, as you do, there's nutrition in that honey. Uh, and isn't it better if we, doesn't it have more medicinal properties if we start eating it in between meals rather than in a cup of tea? It should actually never go into a cup of hot tea because that kills uh, enzymes and certain ferments. It shouldn't even be used in baking to a great extent. Now you find honey in just about everything that you buy in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the big production of honey goes into bread, into all kind of, all kind of things. Yeah, it should be treated like medicine and half a teaspoon or a teaspoon a day, especially for people over 35, mm -hmm. over the midlife, uh, is a great bone strengthener. It, it, it actually strengthens the body and uh, that should take the place for milk. Milk is made actually for the young person and for the older person it should be honey. Wow. And raw. That's interesting. I never, I, I've read a lot about honey and I've never heard that about honey. I knew it was good and medicinally, but to not put it in tea, um, and to have it for bones strengthening, I think that's fabulous. Yeah. I, I think we would do a lot, uh, against osteoporosis if people would eat a little bit of, uh, good raw honey a day. Mm -hmm. Half a teaspoon. It doesn't take much. It's the mm -hmm. silica force that is in, in the honey, the hexagonal force mm -hmm. that is in the cells. And that force is a strengthening force. Of course, once you have osteoporosis, it's not going to help you to eat honey then. Mm -hmm. It should be done uh, before that on a, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Just as uh, Steiner, for example, mentions that uh, a couple that is engaged should eat, both men and women should eat a little honey and the child would not have weak bones. In other words, um, you know, we, we gave vitamin D at one time, you know, the, what was that medicine? Vigantol in Germany. I don't uh, know it in this country. And, 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 yeah, great, uh, great damage done to the embryo at that time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, 
yeah, honey is medicinal. It's the greatest wound dressing for for burns because mm -hmm. honey absorbs water, mm -hmm. moisture, and that would mean you can peel the the wound dressing off without tearing the new skin off. Mm -hmm. so, and it's antiseptic too, right? Yes, yes. My dentist gave me a sheet of paper where they are using honey now after tooth extraction. Huh, how about that? I haven't heard that in my neck of the woods, but something to keep in mind when we go to our dentist, huh? <laughs> right. Now, I don't think many dentists know that. I have a very no, young I don't think they do either. Dentist. Okay, well, listen, we're getting um, close to our time here, and I would love you to, to give us your contact information for the Spikenard Farm Honeybee Sanctuary in any way we can, you know, contact you folks. Okay. Uh, can I say a little bit more about the importance of the bees beyond yes. pollination? Yes. So most people know about pollination, you know, from 35 to 70 percent, depending on your diet. If you eat a lot of um, pasta, uh, noodles, and so on, you, you don't need uh, the bees as much as if you, eat, if you eat a lot of veggies and fruit, mm -hmm. because all of our grain are wind pollinators. They don't need these insects. And uh, beyond that, uh, the honeybee is actually very important, together with, uh, with the ants and the hornets and the wasps, because they produce a poison called formic acid. Uh, the Latin name formica means ant. So it's the, the acid that the ants produce when they bite you and you get a little welt. Mm -hmm. And that acid is as important for all living beings, just like our DNA, that acid is important for every cell. So it's actually the insects the stinging insects which are keeping nature alive. It's not that we are keeping nature alive. It's uh, these stinging insects. And it has been shown that where the ants are missing in the forest, the forests are dying more quickly. Oh, how about that? That's a, a that's another dot I don't think we've connected uh, very easily to. Uh, I'm in the Master Gardener program, and that's not something that I hear about. Um, in any constructive way. So that's, no. uh, thank you yeah. for sharing that. Most people don't know that, but uh, I thought yeah. it's important. And so, of course, uh, one other aspect is that in all the, of all the animals, the bees are the ones that show us actually what our human evolution, the end goal actually is, and that is service. In other words, they pollinate what needs to be pollinated, whether it's a weed or whether it's whatever it is. What needs to be pollinated, it gets pollinated. And um, one single bee, most of the work goes for the future of the hive. That's about 2% goes for herself. It's about 98% of her work is for the other. And that it can become, if we know enough about the bees, that can become a great inspiration for ourselves. Yes. So the bees, the bees are so close to us. Just imagine they have to, they are the only insect that can drop or raise their temperature, that can maintain a temperature of 95 degrees when there are eggs, larva, and pupa in the hive. 95, almost human temperature. It's the only insect that can do that. Hmm. And they can come to a democratic decision. Imagine if we learn to do that. Right. <laughs> what, the, what this world would look like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so they are a great example for us in how we can evolve if we do it in the right way. So it goes far beyond pollination, what the bees do. It does. And that's what I like about your knowledge, your expertise, your message. And it's 
something that I feel very strongly about as well, that the answers that we need for today's problems are right there in nature. And we're starting to come into a, a mindset, if you will, away from conquer, command, and control into something that is more sustainable. And to be sustainable, we do have to be in some kind of service. We have to take care of the land. We have to think about the next future yes. generations. What yes. Can, Yes. What can we do that leaves this place better than when we arrived? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, it's the opposite. What can I get out of the land, out of the animal, out of the other human being? You know, no, no, actually no sense of the future. And that has to do with our still being very deep in a materialistic culture. In other words, we don't know that we don't only live once. <laughs> So if once we would know generally that uh, we come back, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. might take care of this place in a better way. Well, you know, I, I was just reading Brian Weiss's work on past life. He's an expert in the field. He's a psychiatrist. And he said the same thing. He said we could be the children that's inheriting what we've done today or the grandchildren. Yeah. And that certainly w would wake me up a little differently, right? Uh, oh, definitely. We are the evolution. It's not that we are here and then somebody else evolves. Exactly. We, we are the evolution. Mm. Such wise words, Gunther. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, uh, I think in the United States, we are really the only place that give shorter and longer workshops going into great depths. We have a two year program. We have a four session program. We have a one week program uh, about the bees. So I think the Spikenut Farm is really the place where you can learn about how to care for the bees and be with the bees and enjoy them too mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in a wonderful way. And we have a really beautiful sanctuary. People come from all over the world from to see it and to take classes. Mm -hmm. Australia, mm -hmm. Israel, um, Germany, France, uh, yeah, UK and Ireland, where people come from all over. Mm. It is a beautiful farm. I've had the wonderful privilege of vis visiting your farm a few years ago. And to see people just burst into smile and, they're, and you can feel their deep caring for the bees on, on the sanctuary that you've created uh, is a gift yeah. right there. And, and, and what makes the people perceive something that they don't see is that we use the biodynamic preparations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yep. And yeah, and, and that creates a vibrancy and a health for the land. And since you cannot separate the bees from the land, whatever you do to the land, you do for the bees. Yes, but we also do that to ourselves. And whatever you do for the bees, you do for the land. Yes. Yeah, it's all interconnected, isn't it? So just leave us with your contact information and we'll close. Spikenut, www.spikenutfarm.org and you get our phone number and email. Yeah, and all of that is in our website. Yes, cool. All right, well, what, uh, Gunther, I want to thank you again. I, I'm really grateful and honored to have you here and also for your wisdom and your very practical advice. So I want to thank you for joining me again today. This is Judith Dreyer. I'm the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, Goodreads, and more. I'd like to remind all of you that a transcript is available for this podcast, and please like and share them. Let's support each other and get the word out. Remember, now is the time for practical action and profound interchange so we value our world once again. Enjoy your day.